Hello ladies and gentlemen and thank you for tuning in to the Progressive Parent YouTube channel. I'm here with Bonnie Harris, MSED. She has been a parenting specialist for 25 years, is the director of Connective Parenting, which you can find at www.bonnieharris.com and that's B-O-N-N-I-E. H A R R I S. She's appeared on the Today Show, Asia News, ABC, Australia Broadcast, amongst others, and having been featured in Parenting Parents, Good Housekeeping, Essence, and Working Mother magazines. Hi, Bonnie, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Yeah, I'm fantastic. Thank you very much for coming on the show. It's great to have you. Sure. It's good to be here. Now, we're here to talk about understanding behaviour, but before we go into that, so we know a little bit more about you and your background, maybe you can tell us a bit about the Parents Guidance Centre that you founded in 1990 in New Hampshire and what you learned from your experiences there. Well, I started the centre because of what I had learned as a parent and uh, watching my children learn and grow and what they responded well to and what they didn't. And I wanted, uh, was very much a passion of mine to work with parents and to teach them. I had gone back to graduate school and uh, I came up here to New Hampshire to, to teach parenting groups. So I started the Parent Guidance Center and over the years it has morphed and changed and it's now the River Center, which is a full resource center for not only parents, but individuals all over the area. So, so it's, I'm very proud of it. It's grown to be quite a wonderful organization. And we continue to teach parenting classes. Wow, yeah, it really does sound like you've got a lot to be proud of there. In your workshops, which were based on your 2003 book called When Your Kids Push Your Buttons, you explain that typically we think of children's behavior, like children's behavior leads to our reactions. And I was wondering what's wrong with that kind of thinking? Well, when we look at behavior at face value, we're missing what the child is really trying to tell us. And typically what we do in our parenting culture is react to the behavior as we have been taught over generations and generations to reward the behavior we like and to punish uh, the behavior that we don't like. And that, that is, is a very strong misconception of what behavior is for and how we as parents need to understand it and interpret it. So it's it's pretty much uh, a mission of mine to help parents understand what their children's behavior is really, where it's really coming from. I certainly don't have the answer to what it means. It's of course different with every child. But it's about changing our perceptions so that we understand that the behavior is not to be taken at face value. Um, shall I continue on with my um, metaphor here to Please teach, teach what behavior really is? I, I use a couple of metaphors, um, but I'll... Uh, I'll stick with one. One of the metaphors I use is that behavior is like root, uh, weeds in a garden. And if, as anyone who plants a garden understands that when we see the weeds and we don't want them, if we just grab at the shoots, grab at the weeds that we see, the weeds are going to be back in the next day because the roots are still there. So we have to get down and dirty and dig with our trowels and get down under the soil to get the roots out. And that's very similar to behavior. If we just punish or reward the behavior, we're not getting to the roots of the behavior, to the real causes of the behavior. And the metaphor that I like the best that I use the most now is that of an iceberg. 
So what we know about icebergs is that what we see on the surface of the water is merely 10% of the iceberg, and 90% of it lies beneath the surface of the water. And in that 90% lies, uh, is that 90% is equivalent to the internal emotional state of the child, which is where behavior begins. So Webster, the dictionary, Webster's dictionary defines behavior as the aggregate response of internal stimuli to external stimuli. So what that means for parents is that however your child is feeling internally, whatever obstacles your child is dealing with internally, whether it be um, something that is cumulative from the last five or eight or ten years of their lives, either, you know, whether it's a sense of nobody understands me, I, I'm weird, I'm different, um, <clears throat> I'm not good enough, the, these messages that we get from our parents. So it could be something like that or something that just happened immediately. Somebody just called me a name and, and my feelings are really hurt right now. So all of that is part of the internal emotional state. So that is the internal state and that reacts at any given time with the external, which can be a parent, a teacher, a sibling, a peer, a friend, an event, whatever. So that external meets with the internal feelings and emotions of the child. And the result of that is behavior. We as adults know how to, quote unquote, keep a lid on it. You know, we, we don't go around bearing our souls all the time. We can actually know someone for quite a long time before we find out some crisis that's going on in their life or some deep hurt or concern. We're very good at covering up, but children aren't like that. Thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Children are raw. Their how they feel is written all over them. They don't know how to express it. They don't know how to say, you know, I'm feeling really badly because of the way you yelled at me this morning when I didn't pick up my clothes. I really meant to, but I just well, didn't get to it. And you yelled at me and I felt really badly. The children don't do that. So they hold that in and they and any number of things they hold in until it explodes. And it really has to explode because children can't hang on to that kind of emotional life the way an adult can. And so how they communicate to us about what's going on with them is through their behavior. So if they're feeling badly, their behavior could be throwing, hitting, spitting, pushing, swearing, shouting, lying, whatever. And we take it at face value instead of asking, what is this behavior about? Why is my behavior, why is my child behaving this way? Instead, we think that's not okay. You go to your room or go to timeout or I'm going to take your cell phone away or no more video games for you. We think if we don't like the behavior, we need to punish it. And it will go away. Why we think that's going to happen, I don't know. But um, instead, what we need to do is find out what it is emotionally that's provoking the behavior and then connect with it. So basically, when you see unacceptable behavior from a child, what you want to think is, my child is having a problem instead of my child is being a problem. And that is a major paradigm shift. That to get from 
the perception of my child as being a problem to my child as having a problem is huge. And once you make that perceptual shift, everything else becomes so much easier. And your child feels understood and you can relate in a whole different way. And boy, I know this from personal experience. Absolutely. That's a, a really revolutionary idea for people to come to the realization that by engaging with a child, they will perhaps get more than by just trying to force some immediate compliance or get them to do what they want to do by the threat of carrot and stick. I was wondering if maybe you could share with us some of your alternatives to punishments, you know, some of the ways of digging down into that below the surface iceberg and finding out what's going on for the child and working with them to help them come to more understanding of themselves and maybe a um, more sociable way of relating their inner difficulties to others. Sure. Um... And, of course, as I say, it's different for every child, and it's important for parents to really learn about their child's temperament, temperament being that innate nature of the child, how, who the child is born as, how the child sees the world, because we all come into this world with a different perceptual filter, um, and different behaviors that are part of who we are. Um, and there's lots of material out there to learn about children's temperaments. So we want to know what we, what we can expect from a child rather than, from a particular child, rather than setting expectations for all four-year-olds or all eight-year-olds or this is what my child should be doing because um, he's three or this is what my child should be able to do because he's 10. We want to set our expectations for the child we have, not necessarily the child we wish we had, so that they know that we understand them. So this all comes down to connection. And um, my philosophy is connective parenting. And what that means is if we have this image, and I'd love any of you listeners to take a piece of paper and actually draw in whatever cartoon form you want to do it, uh, an iceberg. And a little bit below the surface of the iceberg, draw a little wavy line to indicate the surface of the water. And above it, in the tip of the iceberg, write down, and you can do this a million times, write down the behavior that is unacceptable to you. And I don't say inappropriate because I'll show you in a moment, or I'll tell you, um, why... All behavior is absolutely 100% appropriate to what is going on in that internal emotional state. It is not necessarily acceptable. So the, put the unacceptable behavior in the section that is above the surface of the water, the tip of the iceberg. And then, and you don't have to do this now, but you might just jot some notes down there, then you want to ask yourself, why do I think my child is behaving this way? So let's say he's hitting a sibling again and again. It's always a fight with the sibling. So fighting, hitting, punching, poking, those are all the behaviors you would write in the tip. And then if you Stop from immediate, that immediate reaction of he's got to learn he can't do that and step back and ask yourself, why is this happening? Why is my child engaging in this behavior? Then in the lower part of the iceberg, 
I want you to write down everything you can possibly think of that could be causing that behavior. So jealousy, um, his sibling has an easier time in life than he does, has more friends than he has, can learn easier than he does, does better in school. Um, maybe he's getting uh, ranked on by a parent or by friends and he's taking it out on his sibling. Um, whatever you can think of. His sibling calls him names, uh, sets him up, in a very clever way to get, to provoke him to hit, gets in his toys, takes things from him, whatever. Just spend some time thinking about what it is. Whenever I do this in a group of parents, when the parent takes the time to think about why the behavior might be happening, you know, they start out with, I have no idea or it's for no reason at all. And that is our knee-jerk, quick knee-jerk reaction. But if you take the time and you ask yourself, what is going on? What could possibly be going on with my child? It's amazing how you're going to be able to come up with many, many ideas. Now I say ideas because these are not facts. These are assumptions you're making. These are um, educated guesses because you know your child, which makes them educated. So some of them are going to be really, hmm, I wonder if somebody called him a name at school and he's taking it out on his brother. That is something you have no idea about unless your child tells you. But more to the point, you know, might be jealousy or getting provoked by the other one or the other one having in more friends or whatever. So then you want to think about what it is that must be going on internally with that child. How must that child be feeling given what you have written down in that below the surface of the water section of the iceberg? So probably a lot of the feelings might be unheard, unimportant, um, angry, frustrated, feeling less than, feeling powerless, feeling uh, jealous, feeling intimidated, feeling not good enough, on and on and on. So you want to really pay attention to those feelings that you know come when certain things like you are assuming are happening for your child. And then ask yourself, what happens when I yell at him? What happens when I send him to his room or send him to time out? Well, what happens is we are adding insult to injury. So those internal feelings, those internal obstacles that your child is dealing with that are provoking this impulsive behavior get worse. It, it, we are building more obstacles. We are creating more tension and more stress in our child. And we want to take that away. You know, where we ever got the idea that making a child feel worse, there through punishment, because punishment always does that, or, uh, well, I'll say more about that in a minute, but punishment always makes a child feel lousy. Why do we think that we first need to make the child feel lousy before he's going to behave better? It does not compute. It does not work. The only way a punishment is going to quote unquote work is by causing the child to fear what is going to happen if the behavior continues. Now, depending on the temperament of the child, some children can stop the behavior because of fear. Some children because of temperament cannot 
stop that behavior because their impulses, their energy, their wiring doesn't allow it. They may want to stop it. They may wish they could, but they can't. So even the ones who can stop it are doing so from the outside in. They're doing so because they're afraid of what's going to happen if they don't stop. And those of us who are more easygoing, um, compliant, adaptable temperaments can do that. We can be punished and we will change our behavior. But let me tell you, that is at a great cost because in doing so, we keep our focus on what someone else wants of us. We lose our voices over time. We lose who we are. And so we go to others to find out who we are. And we don't feel quite good enough. And we don't feel uh, that we can meet up to others' expectations unless we make sure we're doing what they want us to do. And that also is supposition. The more strong-willed child, the child who won't take no for an answer, the child who won't be told what to do, and I have one of those. I have one of each, actually. And those children the cannot stop the behavior that gets yelled at, threatened, punished, um, and... So the behavior continues. The belief in the child that I'm not okay, I must be really bad, results in worse behavior. And a child who is behaving unacceptably to get a message across, you don't understand me. I, I, I hate school. I can't stand being at school. School does not work for me. I'm having a really, really hard time. I need help. This is a child who is very likely acting out. And if the punishment or the threats or the yelling at is only at the behavior, the acting out behavior, what's getting missed is what's going on for the child. So therefore, the child has no option but to get louder and more dramatic with their behavior. So then you get really out of control behavior. You get a child saying things like, I hate myself, I wish I were dead, or I hate you, I wish you were dead. All these horrible things that are nightmares for parents. So instead what we wanna do is make a connection with these feelings that we are pretty sure our child must be feeling if these things are going on. So let's say, let's go back to the hitter. A parent is going to get much more um, attention from the child if the first thing said, once the, if, if there's hurt, you deal with that. You know, if, if a child is hurt, you deal with that. But once you get to a point where emotions are down, the event is over, then you want to come to the perpetrator and say something like, wow, you must have felt incredibly angry at your sister to hit her like that. And then as a toss-off, because I know you know it's not okay to hit. I know you know that. So therefore, that tells me that you must have gotten to a point of extreme frustration or extreme anger to lash out at her like that. So however you want to say that, and of course the shorter the better, but and if your child doesn't know you're going to do this, if you've never address the emotion initially, they're going to wonder where you're coming from. Um, the more your child understands that this is how you relate to him, the less you have to say. However, 
when you address the emotion, when you address his anger or frustration and say, I know that that's what it was that was causing you to hit, your child's ears are going to open. And you're probably going to hear something like, yeah, she never does blah, 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 or she's always blah, blah, blah. And you're going to hear stuff. If you come right at the situation with, don't you ever do that again. How many times have I told you to stop hitting? There is no hitting in this house. Do you hear me? Now you get to your room and think about it. You are never going to hear from that child what's going on with him. Because the message is loud and clear that you don't care. You only care about his behavior. So if you start out with, wow, you must have been so angry with her to do that, then he feels connected to. He feels that you care about how he feels. So then he's going to say, yes, this and that and blah, blah, blah. And then you just stay with that. Oh, wow, I can really understand why that got you so riled up. That must have felt really unfair to you. So you want to stay with what you know, what you guess is going on for your child. If you have a child who says, stop talking like that, then you know you're being patronizing. And that is often a fallout of this kind of connection. It's called any number of things. It's called reflective listening. It's called active listening. I call it connective communication because you're connecting with your child. Often, especially when your child knows that you care about how he feels, all you need to do sometimes is just sit there and listen and be really open and receptive. But when you connect and you're not patronizing about it but you're really understanding I get it I can understand how you feel I bet if I were you I'd feel the same way I really get it how frustrating it is when she gets in here and she gets in your stuff or she wants my attention and I have to give it to her and I'm not paying any attention to you that's gotta really hurt then you've got somewhere to go. So that connection is what is really important to have first before the structure comes in, before the replacement for punishment, which is problem solving. Now, in my mind, punishment does not teach responsibility. Punishment does not teach accountability. All it teaches a child is what his parent doesn't like. So with punishment, depending on the child's temperament, you might be um, get sneaky and secretive. So you're not going to change your behavior, but you're just going to make sure your parent never finds out about it, right? Yeah. Or you're going to be reactive and you're going to fight back, and you're just going to punish your parents all the time, and you're going to either stop talking to them or you're going to call them names and talk to them really rudely. We see this all the time, but we think what we've got to do is come down hard on the behavior, but what we're not getting to is what's causing the behavior. So that's the first step, uh, connecting with the emotional, what, what you guess is going on emotionally. If you're wrong, 99% of the time your child is going to be delighted to tell you you're wrong. No, that's not right. What are you talking about? And then you go from there. Then you say, oh, all right, I guess I was completely off base there. I wonder what was going on with you. So you have an actual respectful communication with your child. And then if you have communicated with the emotion and your child, you know, acknowledges, yeah, she 
pisses me off. She makes me feel so mad. I, I hate her. Then your child, you see, your child then has the safety. If you understand feelings, your child knows he's safe to say things like, I hate her. So you're not going to turn around and say, oh, you mustn't say that. You can't hate your sister. Exactly. Exactly. Because as soon as you do that, you are not safe for your child to share, for him to share what's going on with him. But if you say, you must have felt such and such, or I bet if I were you, or I really understand, or I get it, I get it. And he feels heard, then he's going to feel safe. And then he's going to say things, maybe that you don't like hearing, but at least it gives you some place to go. And it gives him a release of that tension of holding on to his feelings. Now imagine a child who is not allowed or who thinks he's not allowed to share his emotions, but his parent is only saying, you can't hit, you have to stop that, or I'm taking away your computer privileges. I mean, talk about illogical consequences. It's ridiculous. But then he knows that you are not safe to say something like, I hate her, or I get so mad when she does, because you're not going to understand. From his point of view, there's no way in hell you're going to understand him. We want so not, an open space where children can come out honestly and express what they're experiencing so that we can help them work through those experiences and come down to earth to a place where we're able to discuss with them options from improving, for improving the situation. So I would like to ask all the listeners, wouldn't you have loved to have a parent like that? So true. How would you have felt in all of those situations if you had had a parent who talked to you like that? So then, after that connection is made, you know, I'm sure everybody's out there thinking, well, what do you do then? Just let him get away with it? No. It is not about getting away with it at all. It is actually using problem solving so that your child is actually accountable. So then you say, okay, I get it. And it's not okay to slug her. It's not okay to push her. It's not okay to stick a pencil in her arm. So the next time that kind of frustration builds in you, that kind of anger, starts to come up in you. What can you do instead of that? So you're not telling your child, you're not directing, you're not saying this is what you have to do and this is how you do it. You're asking your child, what can you do knowing yourself? What can you do when you feel that way? instead of doing what's not acceptable. And when you're in that kind of connection, I promise you, when your child feels that connection, when your child feels safe to say whatever he wants to say to you, I promise you, your child is going to come up with something. And he might come up with something, especially if he's used to being punished in the past, he might come up with something like, well, if I do it, just put me in time out or send me to bed or whatever, you know. But if you're saying, what can you do when those feelings come up? He's maybe going to say something like, um, I can yell at her instead of hit her. I can come to you. I can, uh, you know, yell a word. You might come up with a word that you agree on, that your child can yell, which cues you to come in and help. 
but you really want the two of them. I mean, sibling rivalry is a whole thing. We, we don't have time to go into all of the ins and outs of sibling rivalry um, because that is a whole uh, conflict re- resolution piece in itself. Problem solving is between the parent and the child. Conflict re- resolution is between the siblings, and it is facilitated by the parent. Now, the key word there is facilitate, not direct. You are the coach, not the referee. You are guiding them with questions. You are helping them work it out between them, between them rather than sending them off to be isolated and separated, separated from each other. So anyway, we're kind of getting off on siblings here, but... Any kind of, you know, your child, you've just found out that your child has not handed in his homework. You get a call or an email from a teacher. Your child is, his, her grades are dropping to the bottom of the barrel because she hasn't handed in her homework for the past two weeks. You are clueless as a parent. So what are you going to do? Well, a lot of parents would immediately confront her and say, why haven't you handed in your homework? What's going on with you? They immediately take the side of the teacher. Instead, what's more effective would be to say something like, I got a call from so-and-so today, or I had an email from your teacher. According to her or him, you haven't handed in homework for quite a while. I'd like to hear your side of the story on that. It's much more likely that you're going to get an honest response from your child when you approach it that way than if you approach it with accusation. When there's accusation, when there's blame, what's the first thing that happens to any one of us? What happens... To you, Anthony, if you fe- if you feel blamed and somebody's accusing you of something, what happens? Well, I might become defensive um, and say. get railed up, or I, or I might even start pointing out things that they've done that were in a similar vein, re- um, irresponsible, and try and shift the attention off me. Exactly. Exactly. So that's what we do. That's what human beings do. We feel blamed. We get defensive. We deflect the blame somehow, somewhere, and depending on our temperaments. So blame does absolutely no good except leads your child to build more bricks on that wall of defense. So they're going to fight back or they're going to, um, you know, become parent deaf, they're going to laugh, laugh. Laughter is often a defense. They're acting like they don't care. That's defense. Um, We learn all kinds of defense mechanisms from the time we're really little, when we feel blamed and threatened. So in order not to do that, you want to hear your child's side of the story. You want you as a parent are your child's ally. You need to be your child's ally. You are always on your child's side. That does not mean letting them get away with it. That does not mean being permissive. I was the real firm one in my family, much more so than my husband. I was very firm, but never blaming and ne- I shouldn't say never. <laughs> Certainly not a perfect parent. We all made mistakes, yeah. Yeah, we all make the mistakes. The difference is when you're a parent who's into this style of parenting, that you acknowledge that when you use these methods, it's a blip. And then you can always come back to the child and say, you know, I'm sorry, I was a bit aggressive before. Or, you know, it really, it really, I really wouldn't have liked to have spoken to you in that way, but... I, I myself um, sometimes become uh, flustered and aggressive and angry because, you know, 
parents are parents, not gods. And absolutely, if, absolutely. And if if we always strive to appeal perfect, then the children may feel like they have to also live up to that standard, which may be an additional pressure. It's it's a good thing to be able to show your human side and your fallibility as a parent or a caretaker of children. Absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things I talk about is uh, um, doing a do-over. And what that means is, you know, after the explosion, after you have behaved regretfully, after your child has behaved regretfully, let it sit. It can be hours, it can be days. It doesn't matter how long. Then come back to it. Because I always tell parents, in the moment, when your button is pushed, when you are reactive, what you want to go for is doing nothing. What you want to go for is leaving the situation alone. And we think in that moment that we have got to do something right now in order to teach a lesson. Nothing can be learned in that moment of reaction that you would want your child to learn. That it can be a very damaging moment and we're all gonna do it. So wait until it's all over Wait until emo your emotions are down and your child's emotions are down. And as I say, it could be hours or even days later. Come back to it and say, remember when that happened. I know that I didn't like how I reacted and I doubt if you did either. Here's what I wish I had said or done differently. I wish I had said to you, blah, blah, blah. Now I can think because my emotions are, are calm and I can think. And I know that when we get, you know, crazy like that, we just react. And then you may leave it at that. You might also say, is there anything you wish you had said or done differently? That is the teaching moment. And also that is a time when most likely if your child was doing something that she knew was not okay. That's a time when she is going to be so eager to say, I'm sorry, mom, I really didn't mean that. And I, especially if you model that for them, you know, like you were saying, we, we need to model that we make mistakes and that we're sorry for them, but we're not just apologizing. We're not only doing that. We're showing them, that we are making efforts to change our behavior, and then they will too. Sure, that's that's really powerful modeling. I think the method that you describe sort of contrasts the old methods, which were to say use a, a carrot and stick, because when you, as you said, when you punish someone, you create resentment in them, and if strong emotions like frustration are creating their acting out, that's only going to add on to the pile. In your model, what we're actually doing is using empathy itself to try and drain the bath, so to speak, of thick negative emotions. So exactly. rather than some, add something on, we're trying to subtract something. And you spoke about these kind of two tendencies in people. One is the more passive approach where after being punished, they, they become quite compliant. And there's some studies to show that those are the same children who are more susceptible to things like peer pressure and things like that. We had those um, Stanford prison experiments where it showed how readily adults would give electric shocks to people when they were told to by an authority figure. So as you say, we may get compliance, but it's at great cost. Then great we cost, yeah. Then we have another sort of child who become, seems to become aggressive, more aggressive, the more they're punished. And that should really be a notification to parents who are working within the old paradigm. You know, some parents will say, you know, it seems like no matter how much I spank them, their behavior won't improve. And, and you think, well, you know, that's because you're, you're spanking them. That's right. 
that's where the, in the old days they used to talk about breaking the will of a child because they wanted to make those aggressive children into the passive ones that took order from authority. But that child is an accident waiting to happen because either they're going to become chronically defiant and rebel against the whole society and perhaps even end up in prison, or they are going to end up acting in all those frustrations on themselves and becoming the kind of child that you said who thinks, I hate myself, I hate you, no one understands me, and eventually feels like there's something wrong with them for the fact that they never feel good. There's a, there's a real tendency to blame the child when maybe the problem is in the environment. Exactly. Exactly. And what I, what I propose with problem solving is that we are engaging the child in a solution to the problem. We're, not, we're first connecting with them and letting them know that we understand what it's like when feelings of guilt and frustration and anger and all of these things come up for us because we all have them. And it's very hard for parents to do this with their children when their parents were not able to do that for them, when they learned as children that negative emotions were not okay. Yeah. So then it, it's really hard for them, and, and it takes a lot of learning and a lot of uh, emptying that bathtub, as you say. I like that image. And But once we can do that, then we want to hand over the direction to our children guided by our questions. So the, the basic questions of problem solving are what is it you want, how can you get what you want, and how can we make that work for both of us? Because here's what I want. So what... What we're saying is you, I mean, we know that our children are egocentric for years and years and years. And once they get to be teenagers, that egocentricity comes back in spades. And that is development. That is normal development. And so we need to be aware of that and know that all they really care about is themselves. So that's our inroad. What is it you want? So in that situation of hitting a sister, what is it you wanted from her? Well, I want her to leave me alone. Okay, I can understand that. How can you get what you want? Well, I can punch her. I can push her away. Is that going to get what you get you what you want? And then you come back to that question. Will what you're planning on doing actually get you what you want? Well, no. So how can you get what you want? Or if it's between me and my child, I want you to come to the dinner, dinner table. Well, the dinner table is probably not a good example, but um, I want you to get your homework done and you want to play video games or you want to talk to your friends or you want to go to baseball practice or whatever it is mm. how do we both get what we want how do we work the situation so both those things get done and it always always works that way and a lot of parents let me tell you a cute little story a lot of parents say, but what do you do when your child is too young to problem solve? Um, first of all, a child is never too young because the first stage of problem solving is giving your child choices. Do you want the blue plate or the green plate? Do you want to turn off the television or do you want me to do it? Do you want to climb in your car seat by yourself or would you like me to put you in? These are all rudimentary problem solving methods. So here's a story of a child who was not yet three. So he was about, he was almost three. And this came out of the first parenting group I ever ran. And we were talking about how to separate the child from the problem, how we can talk about the problem in, in a way that's not blaming. 
And this mom came into group with a story of her two and three quarter year old, who she said knocked over his milk. She said it was not an accident. He was sitting at the counter eating his lunch and he intentionally knocked his milk over. And she said to him, you need to clean that up. And he said, no. And the blood started to boil, of course. And she said, you knocked it over. You spilled it. You clean it up. And he, feeling blamed, said, no, you do it. And then for some reason, the class dropped into her head and she stopped. And she said, okay, the milk has spilled. You don't want to clean it up and I don't want to clean it up. What do you think we should do about it? And he just brightened up. He sat up on his stool and his whole face lit up because little children are brilliant at this. They always come up with ideas. So he said, I know. I'll go call Sophie, their dog, and she can come in and lick up the milk. And then whatever Sophie doesn't get, I'll clean up with a paper towel. <laughs> That's fantastic. And his mother was so dumbfounded, she just dropped her jaw to the table and said, uh, okay. And so he hopped off the stool. He went and called the dog who happily licked up the milk. He went and got a paper towel and not very effectively cleaned up the dog's slobber. Lovely. Problem solved. And I think yeah. what that really shows is children at a young age have very little power to exercise control in their world. So right. being given the opportunity to actually have some control really, really means a lot to them. I mean, some parents are quite hard on children who don't want to share, for example, but kids don't have a lot of stuff and they don't have a lot of control. So they might be possessive over what they do have. And in, in, in a similar vein, for a two-year-old to get um, sort of deciding vote on how something's going to be done is great because they don't just have the access to their limbs, which aren't very powerful, but actually the whole machinations of, the, you know, they have access to your body if the solution represents something like that. By using their mind, they, they can actually feel like they've got a bit of power in their own world. And the, the results of giving them the opportunity to exercise that can contribute to them being great negotiators later on in life, which is a really indispensable skill. Well, in this, in, in the 21st century, what we need children to be able to do, young adults coming up into the work world, what we need them to be able to do is negotiate and problem solve and not be little do-goodies following in somebody else's footsteps. That does not cut it in this world the way it used to. Obedience used to be, way back in the early part of the 20th century, used to be the number one value parents wanted to teach their children for good reason. It is for no good reason anymore. We do not want obedient children. We do not want our children following um, peer pressure and, and bad influences. We do not want our children to just do what somebody else tells them to do. We want them to be able to say, no, I don't want to do that. I'm not doing that. And to know why, because it doesn't feel right inside. That's called intrinsic motivation as opposed to the carrot and the stick, which is extrinsic motivation. Sure. And, you know, both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation are somewhat natural to the human condition. I mean, sometimes we might work extra hours to get more money and that's an extrinsic motivation. But artificially applying extrinsic motivations to children is very likely to help them lose touch with the intrinsic motivation that they have. And if they remain in touch with that, then they can make a decision. Do I want to do what I really want to do right now, which is work on this project? Or do I want to take a few extra hours at work and work on the project at the weekend? At least if you're in touch with what you're intrinsically motivated to do, you've got that choice. Exactly. If, if, yeah, it always involves a choice. 
So I was just thinking, when you were speaking about how you listen to children, it sort of reminded me of what Carl Rogers, the famous therapist, brought in, into therapy, which was creating that space where a client can explore their emotional experience with no judgments or blame, with unconditional positive regard. And in that way, you're sort of creating the same space for a, for a child. And it, and it seems to me if we all brought our children up in this manner, there would be no need for therapists because we'd all been exposed to the skills necessary to be therapists for ourselves and, and one another. I was wondering if those are the skills that we're developing around our children. How can we kind of take it to heart as adults to understand ourselves and our own behavior better and our own motives and, and be more self-understanding and hopefully get more effective at draining the bathtub or draining our own emotional bathtub? Well, that is the question. And that is what my book, When Your Kids Push Your Buttons, is all about. Um, it. Uh, let me just do a little marketing plug here for a minute. Please do. It's, please do. It's available on Amazon. Uh, it's available on my website. On my website, it's available in CDs and MP3 downloads. And um, and I do trainings on it. So what when your kids push your buttons is all about the parent. And what happens to us, what is going on in us when those buttons get pushed? And what we typically do is blame our children for pushing them. But what we need to take responsibility for is the buttons that are there to be pushed. And our children didn't put them there. Our parents, our teachers, our early childhood experiences put them there. And so the process of... Um, and, and, and the book is loaded with exercises. I also have a workbook for it. It's loaded with exercises to help the parent put the, the material, the content of what we're talking about into their own personal experiences. So, uh, for instance, we look at the gap that we create with our children. When we intend to teach our children something and they hear something entirely different because our button has been pushed and we react and we yell at them, we threaten them, we, whatever we do when our button gets pushed. And so our good intention of teaching something goes down the drain. But what our children hear is a very loud and clear message, like I'm not good enough, I'm stupid, you don't love me which the parent would never intend in a million years. And so that goes on between us now. And then what we do is take a look at when we were the child on the other side of the gap and the messages that we took in from our parents when their buttons got pushed and how we can see, and probably one of the most unanimous limiting beliefs that come up again and again and again and again and again is I'm not good enough. And, but there are a gazillion. We could write a book. Well, I did write a book on them. <laughs> and um, so what we, what we do is start out with this um, model that I use that I call the emotional chain reaction. And we see that we look at a behavior that our child is doing. Okay, that behavior we think is what caused me to yell and scream and have to ask 10 times for that child to do what I wanted. So that behavior, our thinking is that my child's behavior has led to my reaction. That's what's caused my reaction. If my child just behaved appropriately, then I could be a perfectly lovely parent. <laughs> so... But then we can put the emotion in there, okay? I, my child's behavior has provoked me to feel angry, frustrated, resentful, guilty, whatever. And that emotion leads to my behavior. Yes, in fact, that part is true. But the missing part that 
the that we do a lot of work on in this book is the fact that when my child does or says that something that pushes my button, I instantly, faster than instantly, make an assumption about my child. That little brat. Here we go again. Why doesn't he ever listen? She's never going to be this. He's never going to do that. He always, she never. All of these things that go through our head at lightning speed. So that assumption is a perception, is a judgment, is an idea, is a jumping to conclusions piece that we have about our child or ourselves. I'm out of control. I don't know what to do as a parent. I never should have had children. I, I'm a loser. I have failed at parenting. These assumptions are what get our, be our emotions going. And our emotions then are what lead to our reactions. So if I think, as I did with my daughter until I got this, if I think she's out to get me. She's doing this on purpose. She is bound and determined to ruin my day. That's what I thought of my daughter's behavior. Those thoughts led me, of course, to feel angry and resentful and just ballistic. And that, of course, led to my very ineffective reactions to her. When I could switch my assumption, which I did one morning, it was like a lightning bolt hit. Instead of thinking she's out to get me, I looked at that same face, that same look on her face, that same behavior, and I thought, wow, she's miserable. And my head did a 180 degree flip, and no longer was she being a problem, but she was having a problem. So I then had compassion for her. And so what we want to do is whenever we see these behaviors that trigger us, we need to step back. And there are, you know, the, the book helps us through the whole process. We need to step back and take responsibility for what's going on in us. It also helps us look at where those limiting beliefs that we have so, for instance, if my daughter says, you can't tell me what to do. You're not the boss of me. Man, that might trigger that old, old belief I have in there that I'm not good enough, that I don't know enough, that I'm not smart enough. And I instantly go back to a time when I felt I was getting that message from my parents or teacher, or whoever, that I wasn't good enough. And that's triggered instantly. And there is brain research. I could, I could tell you exactly what's going on in our amygdala that gets triggered, that never matures, but that our cortex can do work with. Our cortex can take different pictures of what is stored in our amygdala. And that's what this book is about. We can take new pictures of what happened. We can't change our childhoods, but we can change the way we look at our childhoods. We can change how our childhoods are affecting us as adults, and we can make different choices about how our children, how we are effective with our children. And in doing so, we're changing our child's childhood and we're seeing that those button pushers, especially those button pushers, are the most important teachers we will ever have to our personal healing and growth. No therapist can do for us what our child can do for us if we allow it, if we open up, if we are vulnerable enough to say, wow, am I reacting badly there? Why is that? take responsibility for it, and look into it so we can defuse that button and heal. Wow, yes, and uh, that, that sounds absolutely fascinating. I think that so many 
parents and caregivers for children will really identify with those messages that you mentioned, both in terms of judgments of ourselves and judgments of our children or the children in our care. It's been really fantastic to have you on the show. I think you're a really beautiful speaker. And Thank you. Yeah, it's been fascinating. I could just listen to you speak all day. And it comes so naturally to you, and I like your metaphors. I just thought before you go, um, I'd love to mention that in 2008 you wrote another book. We've already spoken about your 2003 book, When Kids Push Your Buttons, but you more recently wrote a book called Eight Principles for Raising Your Raising Kids You'll Love to Live With. And I was wondering if you might whet our appetite for that book by telling us some of your secrets. What are some of those eight principles sure um that was the subtitle that you said the act the title is confident parents remarkable kids and it is in fact just that eight principles that i believe if we can live by we will raise healthy strong effective successful children and so those eight principles, for, for instance, the first one is all children want to be successful. And the second one is behavior is our clue. And those two work together in, in a way that we talked about a lot on the program today. So um, if we know that our children want to be successful and if we believe that, then when they are behaving unsuccessfully, that clues us in to the fact that there is something in their way of being successful, rather than they're choosing to be unsuccessful, which is what we typically think. My child won't do this instead of he can't do that. He can't do that because there's something in the way. And I go into connective communication, I go into problem solving, I, um, I go into uh, one of the principles is what we focus on grows. And typically we focus, put a lot more focus on negative behavior than positive, and so we're growing negative behavior. Um, there are a lot of principles like that. That's the first half of the book. The second half of the book, I talk about seven uh, different Typical events in a day, getting up in the morning, um, mealtime, school, homework, chores, sibling rivalry, stuff like that. Um, and, I, in, and, I, and each one is a story. And then in those stories, I put all eight principles to work in each one of those. So it's very hands-on. It's very uh, applicable. It's very... Um, it's a little more how to in terms of how do I, what do I use, what tools do I use to help me bring up my children. Wonderful. And I just want to thank you once again for coming on the Progressive Parent Channel. You can find Bonnie Harris at www.bonnieharris.com and perhaps we'll speak to you again. Uh, maybe okay. On, maybe on sibling rivalry since that came up during this interview. Right, right. Take care now. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.